I will uh, Sajib, good evening. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Now, what? Wow. We are live. We can start. Oh, yeah, we are live. Ah, up live, what? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So the moment we start, Professor Neil Aroda, I would like to have blessings from our Godfather of Gastroenterology of Bihar, Professor B.K. Agarwal, who is the founder of the Gastroenterology in Bihar. And he has shaped many of us, has inspired all of us, and has been a Godfather to all of us, always. And he has taken the flags of the Gastroenterology to the highest place in Bihar. So welcome, sir, Professor B.K. Agarwal, sir. But I would like that you should bless us and you with the where after that we start this session, sir. Right, sir, right, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma, for a nice introduction. See, this uh, I was very much pleased to learn the gastro update under the banner of API and uh, IMA Bhagalpur uh, is being organized. And by webinar, actually, the uh, live conferences are now is possible. Uh, difficulty is uh, because of COVID-19. So the trend has changed, and we have to change our way we live. So I, I'm, I'm grateful to Dr. Akhay Chaudhary, Dr. Obed Ali, and Dr. Hem Shankar for inviting me to participate in this program. And uh, it is purely a gastro conference, like. And uh, we were already very happy to know that Bhagalpur uh, is organizing this program. And uh, the, the good lectures by Dr. Anil Rora, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, and Sanjeev Thakur on this various topics of gastroenterology. And uh, I, I, I'm grateful uh, for the organizer, organizers for organizing this program. So my best wishes and greetings. And I hope this webinar will be very fruitful to physicians and uh, general practitioners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. Thank you very much. Let us start, Dr. Hemshankar Sharma with Dr. Professor Anil Arora. Yeah, yes, sir. If he's ready. Professor Arora, sir, you are ready? Yes, I am ready, sir. Ready. Then I, I'll just yes. ask Sanjeev. You have uh, been the uh, in the core committee always with many teams with Dr. Anil Aroda. I, I, I just request you to take the command with uh, Dr. Vinay Kumar or, and Dr. A.K. Sinha, sir. So please uh, manage this session. Dr. Sanjeev, please. Always on, sir. Welcome, Professor Aroda. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, good evening, everybody. I am Dr. Anil Arora. I am Head of Gastroenterology at Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi. First of all, I am thankful to Dr. Uh, Hem Shankar and Raji for having given this opportunity of presenting to you the journey of fat in the body. All of us are so used to listening to the talks of so-called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So I thought I will make some changes. I will try to change the diet and tell you what is fat. Is it a friend or a foe? Is it that we eat too much and we accumulate in the, uh, in the whole body the fat? Is it our friend or foe? So the title of my talk is Fat in the Body. Is it a friend or foe? Are my slides visible? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So what is fat? All of us in our own scientific and colloquial language almost daily keep on referring 
to oh this is a fatty guy this boy has no fat and there is a fat in the liver but do we really understand what are the fats now let me tell you very simply what a fat means fat may simply be a word that has several meanings in biology it may be a type of tissue it may be a type of a cell or it may be a class of molecules so either the molecules or the cells or the tissues are collectively referred to as fats what are these fatty acids fatty acids are primarily straight hydrocarbon chains they are organic hydrocarbon chain acids and the number of the carbon atoms in the in the chain varies from 4 to 24 typically in human beings we have long chain fatty acid in which the in higher organisms the number of the carbon atoms in this hydrocarbon chain is anywhere from 14 to 18 and what is this fat which we refer to on day to day basis is basically a glycerol which is a carbohydrate moiety in which three different fatty acids are attached so if you take a carbon background of glycerol and attach three fatty acids to it then this becomes triglyceride tri means three and glyceride is for glycerol so a combination of three fatty acid attached to a three carbon organic acid is called glyc triacyl glycerol or tag tag is the same thing which is used by scientists to convey the meaning of fat to the general public so what are the, why is it that we want to know on this sunday evening about the fat are they important to us are they our friend or foe let's see what do they do in the body if this fatty acid is attached to the carbohydrate molecule then this becomes the triglycerides and triglyceride is something which is extremely important component of the food which we eat on day to day basis this could be saturated unsaturated or trans fat if the same fatty acids which are straight hydrocarbon chains if it is attached to the fast food head then this becomes a phospholipid lipid attached to a phosphate classical example is lecithin almost all our cell membranes in the body the integrity of which is so important for us to be present and living is made up of the fats and then fats are something which are synthesized to form cholesterol which is a precursor molecule for formation of the enzymes and hormones without hormones you know our body cannot survive so you would have daily been hearing about the different types of fat let me explain you what do these means you have a substance called saturated fatty acid this is a classical example of a straight hydrocarbon chain in which there is no place for the hydrogen to be inserted that means all carbon bond between individual carbon atoms are single bonds so if there is no place for attachment of a fat hydrogen uh, atom in this chain this becomes a saturated fatty acid this is called palmitic acid then you can have a mono unsaturated fatty acid that means along the chain of the carbon to carbon bond you have this area in which you can attach this is a double carbon to carbon bond which can permit you the attachment of a single hydrogen atom so this becomes a mono unsaturated fatty acid classical example is stearic acid and then there is a molecule in which there are two places at which there is a double carbon to carbon bond and you can attach more than one hydrogen atom to this unsaturated fatty acid so this becomes a polyunsaturated fatty acid so what is fat fat is basically a triacyl glycerol which could either be a simple fatty acid which is totally saturated that means you cannot attach any hydro hydrogen in this straight carbon chain you can have one hydrogen which can be inserted here because of the presence of the double carbon to carbon bond this is becomes a mono unsaturated fatty acid or mufa and then finally something which is dear to most of us polyunsaturated fatty acid that is vegetable oil in which multiple carbon to carbon bonds are available in which you can insert the hydrogen hydrogen atom so this becomes a polyunsaturated fatty acid so how do we distinguish between the three if you have a saturated fatty acid these are straight chains they are densely packed and they have a high melting temperature so they are solid at room temperature the classical example is butter so if you are eating butter please understand you are taking a saturated fatty acid then you have unsaturated fatty acids in which 
you, the straight chains are bent now. These are less densely packed, and you have a low melting point, and hence they are liquid at temperature. Classical example is all these vegetable oil, custard oil, pineapple oil, and uh, uh, and uh, other types of vegetable oil. All these are the unsaturated fatty acid. Then you have densely packed straight chains of the carbon atoms, which have a high melting point. These are the trans fats, and all of you know as physicians that trans fats are the worst part for the body. so triglycerides or the dietary fatty acids could be saturated and these come from the animal sources you have unsaturated fatty acid which come from the vegetable oils and then you have the trans fat which are the synthetic ice cream chocolate candies and all this processed food is primarily made up of trans fat which are the worst for the human body let's see what is the journey of fat in the body once you take in fat in the body the bigger molecules are emulsified by the presence of the bile in the intestinal tract smaller molecules are split into different components and then this fatty acids are absorbed into the intestinal epithelial cells and because of their sheer size they cannot be transported into the blood so hence they go into the lymphatic system as against glucose and amino acids which travel directly from the intestinal lumen into the blood because of the sheer size of these fat molecules and since they are hydrophobic in nature they have to be covered by a substance called lipoproteins so the fatty acids have to have a covering of the lipoproteins before they are exported out of the intestinal lumen into the lymphatics so the blood cannot absorb take the fat directly from the intestine it has to first go into the intestinal uh, lymphatics and from there into the lymphatic system of the body so once you have phospholipids it covers up the hydrophobic fatty acid which are important for the transport of the fat into the body so this is what happens this is a classical example of a chylomicron molecule you have in the center of it the hydrophobic phobic fatty acids then there is a covering of cholesterol on to on to the top of it then you have a apoprotein which is able to characterize this as a particular type of lipoprotein which carries it to the different parts of the body so once you absorb your food it is absorbed as chylomicrons into the lymphatic system and these chylomicrons supply the fat both to the fatty tissue as well as the muscle where it is taken up part of the triglyceride is taken up by the fatty tissue depending upon its need rest of it goes back into the liver and liver disposes of this fat in the form of formation of uh, cholesterol and bile which is excreted into the uh, into the biliary system and producing the so called enterohepatic circulation let's see when the uh, when the fats are being transported from the small intestine into the blood what happens there are different types of lipoprotein which are present in the body daily if you as physicians you are used to looking up the lipid profile report of all individuals and this is what you get you get a report of hdl ldl vldl chylomicron remnant and chylomicron what are these and what are the implications of understanding this in fact if you have a chylomicron that means there is a large amount of the fat in it with minimum amount of protein it is comes from the small intestine because of the ingestion of the food now part of this triglyceride is picked up by the peripheral tissue and remain part is called chylomicron remnant so this becomes the chylomicron remnant which is picked up by the liver liver on its own disposes of the cholesterol by attaching a lip apolipoprotein called apo1 and it puts it out to the other parts of the body as vldl the other parts of the body take out some fat from this ldl vldl and leave something called ldl which is a bad cholesterol and hdl cholesterol is a good cholesterol because it picks up the remaining part of the cholesterol from the body and gets it back to the liver that is the reason if you look at the function of the hdl this is something which cholesterol it causes a reverse cholesterol transport that means the bad cholesterol from the different parts of the body is picked up by hdl cholesterol and is brought back into the liver so with chylomicron you have the highest amount of fat in the 
the molecule and in hdl you have the minimum amount of fat in the molecule so this is the most dense particle and this is the least dense particle so the fat which is absorbed from the body can be either used as a source of energy or if you are eating too much it can be stored in the adipose tissue or else it can be used for structural components of the body function let's see how it is used as a source of energy now all the fat which i have described to you is made up of hydrocarbon chain if you look at single average molecule of the triglyceride or a tag which i have shown you earlier it necessarily gets converted into water carbon dioxide to produce ATP. so almost 84% of the triglyceride which you consume that is fat you are consume is ultimately going to get converted into carbon dioxide so can we say that consumption of the fat is the most important reason for contamination of the air pollution by co2 the answer is no it only contributes 2% of the carbon pollution maximum carbon pollution of the air comes from the petroleum and the coal mine industry if you use fat that is the biggest source of energy in the body let's say you are not able to eat for few days and you are just dependent on your glycogen store in the body in typically in a body you have a total of 500 g of glycogen stored in the liver 1 g of glycogen gives you 4 calories so you have a total of 2000 calories which are available to you without eating your food so if you are dependent only on glycogen without eating you may die after one day because you can you need at least 2000 calories for the routine functioning of the body if you are not eating anything and you are dependent on muscle muscle typically weighs around 6 kg in a normal adult human being 1 g of the muscle gives you 4 calories so you have a total of 24000 calories so if you do not eat anything and you are dependent on protein you will be able to survive for 12 days but look at the beauty of this fat fat is present in almost all adipose tissue you have a total of 12 kg of fat in the body one single gram of the fat gives you 9 calories so you have a total of 1 lakh 10000 calories which are stored in the body so you can survive for 60 days that is the reason if people like anna hazare can be in fast for 2 months at a stretch this is the fat which is giving them the persistent calories to sustain, sustain their vital organs and not the glucose or the fat so fat is something which is so important for energy especially at the time of starvation when you are not able to eat anything for different reasons so once the body gets excessive storage of the fat it can go either into the subcutaneous tissues like you have peripheral obesity and once that is completed it spills over into the visceral tissues that is the liver pancreas and the heart in addition at the same time when the fat is being supplied to the body it is important for maintaining the healthy skin of the body it maintains the right body temperature it is important for smooth functioning of the cells it gives you cushioning of the organs it is important for neurostructural component of the brain and retina it is important for absorption of the fat soluble vitamin it it is an immune booster and it is a shock absorber for the vital organs of the body including the bones why is it that such a good friend of yours called fat suddenly becomes a enemy or it becomes into a foe this is the data recently published that with increasing increasing industrialization and prosperity all across the world human beings have been eating 160% more calories than what they need earlier the animal from which as the human being from which who has already evolved, evolved from the animals would go in hunting for the food but with decreased physical activity and easy availability of the food you are having much more than what you need to eat so excessive fat ultimately gets stored in the aberrant tissues so this is called overflow hypothesis and once the capacity of the over fatty acid exceeds in deposition into the common organs like skin subcutaneous tissue it tends to get deposited into the important uh, organs of the body like liver heart kidney and that is where it starts giving you the complication so is it that there is a behavioral problem that one overeats by taking excessive nutrition or obesity is basically a genetic problem we do not know let me give an example once you start eating lot of food you become obese once you are obese then you have insulin resistance insulin resistance leads to fatty liver and once you have a fatty liver then all complications start let me give you a very simple example of how obesity develops so this is a rat 
which is being fed by the staple diet look at this young boy who keeps on eating chocolate and the candies normally if you eat chocolate or candies you will have increased blood sugar that will lead to release of insulin which will go and deposit the fat and glucose into the adipose tissue so once there is a deposition of the fat and adipose tissue in the uh, uh, in the fatty tissue because of the insulin there is a release of hormone called leptin now leptin will go into the hypothalamus and tell the hypothalamus that there is enough of food please stop eating what happens in obese individual look at this guy who in spite of being chubby keeps on finishing up whatever chocolates candy it has so what happens is that the glucose which goes into the adipose tissue stimulates the release of leptin somehow leptin is not able to act on to the hypothalamus and lead to a negative feedback in inhibition that is in spite of the fact that you have a lot of glucose this person continues to eat because there is something called leptin resistance at the level of hypothalamus so hypothalamus does not realize that you have enough of the food and should and does not give you a feeling of satiety so this is a normal person who has a lot of fat in the body this is stored as something which is needed for energy so this you have fat in the body which gives you a particular type of phenotypic cells you have m1 and m2 type of macrophages in a normal individual the storage of the fat only stimulates m2 macrophages that means something which is anti inflammatory look at this guy who is chubby he has lot of fat with increasing amount of the fat there is a ischemia of the fatty tissue so that leads to inflammation in the form of pro inflammatory cytokine release so this changes the profile of the macrophages from m2 to m1 so you have release of the pro inflammatory cytokine from the fat adipose tissue and once you have excessive nutrien you will develop insulin resistance because of this pro inflammatory cytokines let's see how do these pro inflammatory cytokines which are released from the fatty tissue cause insulin resistance for insulin to act on to the surface of the adipose tissue or the muscle tissue you need to have action on the insulin receptor which leads to tyrosine phosphorylation leading to the action of the movement of the glut4 receptor on to the surface of the of the hepatocytes or muscle cell leading to intake of the glucose what happens in patient with insulin resistance is that this tyrosine phosphorylation is converted into serine phosphorylation so that there is no stimulus of the insulin to let the glucose slip in leading to the hyperglycemia and insulin resistance in addition the obesity induced cytokines produce pro inflammatory cytokines which stimulate serine phosphorylation so that the insulin is not able to act leads to formation of insulin resistance so this insulin resistance leads to deposition of the fat in the liver so in a patient who has a normal functioning insulin you will have stimulation of the glut4 receptor and deposition of the fat in the liver similarly glucose is also utilized by the liver whereas in patients who have insulin resistance you cannot have deposition of the glucose in the liver there is in increased lipolysis so lot of fat comes out into the circulation leads leading to the deposition of the fat in the liver and once you have a peripheral resistance you have lot of fat which enters the liver <laughs> leads to fatty liver disease and once you have a fatty liver disease that itself triggers because of the presence of the fat in the liver you have disruption of the oxidative stress mechanism of the uh, mitochondria of the hepatocytes leading to development of fatty liver disease in nash once you have fatty liver disease that causes insulin resistance hyperinsulinemia and development of diabetes in addition fatty liver disease because of the change in the atherogenic co component of the lipid also leads to development of hypertension and cardiovascular disease in addition once you have fatty liver disease because of the release of the re reactive oxygen species and pro inflammatory cytokines you have significant effect on the kidney at the same time once you have insulin resistance that leads to hyperinsulinemia some of these insulin producing genes also end up stimulating the mitotic genes and all of us know that obesity is associated with higher incidence of gi cancer in addition patient with fatty liver disease also have lot of endocrinopathy in the form of hypothyroidism pcos osteoporosis and hypogonadism mm -hmm. so how is it that fat which till recently was your friend suddenly has become your enemy 
it is producing fatty liver disease it is causing obesity diabetes hypertension cardiovascular disease ckd malignancies and endocrinopathy so there are two sides of the coin ladies and gentlemen in patients who have fatty liver disease so if you have enough amount of the fat which is needed for functioning of the body it will give you good healthy skin it will maintain the body temperature it is important for functioning of the body it will give you cushioning of the body organs it is important for maintaining the integrity of the brain and the retinal neuro uh, uh, lipid components it is important for absorption of the fat soluble vitamins and it is important for shock absorber component of the bones and the vital organ but if you have too much of the fat there is an unending chain of events which lead to complication which is affecting almost all parts of the body so some of ladies and gentlemen fat is an energy rich nutrient which is digested and absorbed by tightly regulated process though invaluable in maintaining health dietary excesses may lead to plethora of problem with potential to affect almost every organ in the body the initiation of the fatty liver and insulin resistance are crucial initial steps in the disease cascade and need to be addressed ta- addressed timely and aggressively so well, how do we deal with this fat i think dr bk agarwal will be able to tell us how to deal with this too much of the fat it's just like a me too movement as much as you would wish to do away with this girl you certainly cannot escape it with that i'll stop sharing my slide and hand over the proceeding back to the organizers thank you very much dr rova dr hem khandar ji yeah excellent excellent uh, uh yeah display of a scientific subjects uh, very nicely revised our core topics uh, one thing that we are getting increasingly these days like we are getting uh, reports of fatty liver we are frequently getting reports of fatty pancreas so do we think that similar pathology might expect there or uh, do we see any adversity to the pancreas with these deposits yeah. you see if you look at the evolution of the man the fat deposition has been available in the higher animals because this is the only energy source which is available in the absence of the food so by evolution from from birds to mammals to higher animals to human being god has given this uh, given this as a evolutionary change you know in big animals they would would have look at the birds they will cross the trans uh, arabic seas for six months at a stretch they survive because of the presence of the fat in the liver evolutionary we have inherited that step but we have not been hunting for the food and food availability has become very easy so evolution has given us capacity to store fat but we do not know how to utilize it that is what is giving this problem to begin with fat will get deposited into the subcutaneous tissues and peripheries once those stores are exhausted it will come into the vital organ of which pancreas is equally important we have been recently i agree we have been concentrating only on the liver but current concepts also show that deposition of the fat in the liver can cause sarcopenia yesterday only we had a very beautiful seminar on sarcopenia and liver disease and recently it has been shown that both diabetes mellitus and pancreatic cancer are more likely to develop if you have deposition of the fat in the pancreas as well i agree with that i see described by professor arora with the basics and it has given a basic theme how the things start and how it goes a, a thing which was trained earlier has become a core in the later stage and we this is a time for us to understand and to follow what we have to do to be healthy in our future life and it is very essential and it is an ongoing topic that sanjeev thakur has generally raised a quite an important issue that we are concentrating at the moment on the non alcoholic fatty liver disease but at the same time the incidence of fibrous pancreas is also going very high and we have to look after this and uh, professor rora you have uh, nicely described uh, from the basics to the end uh, and uh, we have to be very careful in dealing with these problems thank you very much dr hem shankar sharma please dr hem shankar sharma you are unmute yourself dr hem shankar sharma uh thank you prof sanil rawat sir it was a nice lively talk now i i hand over the proceedings to dr rp jaiswal to further conduct the sessions 
लेटेस्ट फार्माकोलॉजिकल मैनेजमेंट ऑफ पोर्टल हाइपर टेंशन पोर्टल हाइपर टेंशन इज बेसिकली एन पार्ट एंड पार्सल ऑफ द लिवर डिजीज there are three types of portal hypertension prehepatic hepatic and post hepatic the treatment and the evaluation is variable but i presume if you want to know how do we treat cirrhosis related portal hypertension the drugs of the choice are beta blockers and uh, uh, then uh, depending upon the complication associated with portal hypertension including bleeding you have other options like steps so it is a broad topic depending on the etiology you have to tailor your answer according beta blocker selective or the general ones like propranolol or the selective carbidolol or bisoprolol uh, or nebulolol what what you would yeah, recommend yeah. yes in fact there has been no head to head comparison between carbidolol and propranolol in terms of the potency carbidolol is far more potent than propranolol in reducing the portal pressure that is one secondly when you are using carbidolol it is a dual action it is a alpha blocker as well as it also is a beta blocker as against propranolol which is a non selective beta blocker only only thing is because it is more potent it is more likely to induce hypotension in when you are using carbidolol versus propranolol you do not need to monitor the pulse rate when you are using carbidolol you will have to monitor the systolic blood pressure which should not be more than 90 in fact in advanced disease of the liver that is child c or if the patient has bad liver function then it is better to use ciplar than uh, carbidolol the reason is carbidolol being more potent is more likely to produce hypotension and uh, and uh, with the hypotension you are more likely to have disruption of the kidney function so given the choice if you want to do use beta blocker in early stages of the portal hypertension and for higher reduction of the portal pressure then carbidolol is the drug of choice in patient in which there is a problem with the heart or there is a contraindication like bradycardia or other cardiac dysfunction then carbidolol is a drug of choice nicely so may i sir yes sir so that is uh, from sudha call is there any relationship between epileptic convulsions and severe vomiting and acid reflux problem uh you know uh, epilepsy has everything to do with the brain it is a, because of the hyper stimulation of the cortical neurons which are more sensitive in general this has nothing to do with the reflux esophagitis but most of the patient with epilepsy will have autonomic disturbances including vomiting and uh, reflux but reflux and vomiting per se will not produce convulsion so because convulsion is something which gives you a total disarray of the physiological function of the body so vomiting and reflux can be a part of it not a vice versa the last one from dr kk saxena how to reduce fat in liver you see as i said that uh, fat in the liver will occur only in conditions and the mechanism and adaptation on the part of the body to deposit it, deposit the fat in the area where which is meant to be depositing fat like subcutaneous tissue like visceral tissues that is the area where it is supposed to be deposited so once those stores exceed it will spill over to the liver so if it is a balance between your energy intake and your energy expenditure spent either by for routine day to day physiological processes of the body or physical activity or exercise compared to what you eat the excessive fat has no reason but to go into your liver so if you want to reduce fat in the liver control your weight decrease your caloric intake exercise regularly control your diabetes and control your lipid 9 out of the 10 times you will get fat free what is the role of uh, vitamin e in fatty liver disease yeah in fact there is a publication from one of our colleagues dr uh, uh, arun sanyal 
I'm sure Dr. Uh, B.K. Agara would, re- would remember that he was our colleague at All India Institute of Medical Sciences. They published this very famous trial called Pavin's trial in New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. And since then, it has been recommended as one of the drugs which causes an antioxidant action. It tries to improve the inflammation in the liver. But problem is the study has been carried out for a period of only about uh, six months to one year. We do not know whether we can continue to give long-term vitamin E because there has been some concern recently that if you use a recommended dose of 800 microgram of vitamin E daily for a period of more than a year or so, then there is a higher risk of hemorrhagic stroke, there is a higher risk of prostatic carcinoma, and there is a higher risk of overall mortality, all-cause mortality. So these are the basic concerns. So in a patient with fatty liver disease, so if you want to try it for a few months to decrease the inflammation and improve ALT, then it is justified. On a long-term basis, it is still not recommended because of its associated side effects. What do you think? What, my, what should be the time period? Safe. Yeah. You see, my, my impression is that you know, anything which is not long-lasting will never be of use in fatty liver disease. If we understand the basis, the way I try to tell you where does the fat come in, how does it get deposited, what triggers the insulin resistance, first and foremost, and I think the only thing which matters in fatty liver disease is that your calories have to be less than what you expend. If you are not able to tackle that balance of intake and output of the calories, nothing on the earth will help pharmacologically. So restriction of the calories, regular exercise is the sine qua non for treatment of fatty liver disease. No pharmacotherapy in near future, at least for the next 10 years, is going to be of use. Thank Sir, you very much. Uh, uh, about what Victor Colic has said, in the doses yeah. that is available to us in present times and the cost, where it stands in your treatment algorithm. Yeah. You see, uh, recently we presented a very lively, I don't know whether you attended that or not, the pathobiology of bile acid metabolism. We just tried to elucidate all the mechanism as to where does effects are agonist, like obitocolic acid act? If you look at the uh, studies from the pivotal trials, that is the regenerate trials, their recommendation is that it does decrease fibrosis when given for a period of at least 18 months in a dose of 25 milligram. And it has potential side effects, which include increase in the cholesterol, decrease in the HDL, and severe pruritus. 50% of the patient on a 25 milligram will develop pruritus. Now, you are using a drug for a long period of time, which is increasing your cholesterol, decreasing your HDL, that is increasing your bad cholesterol, decreasing your good cholesterol, and causes pruritus at a dose of five times with what tablet is available with you in the form of five or 10 milligram tablet. Tell me, how will you use it? That is the biggest problem. I, we recently presented this webinar on FXR metabolism. And we showed because this molecule has eight different stereochemical arms. It's just like an octopus. And it will have multiple actions which you do not need. If it is decreasing fibrosis in the body, in the liver, then it should not cause increased cholesterol. It should not cause decreased HDL. Because if you remember clearly in patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, most of the patient in the absence of the cirrhosis, they die of heart disease, not because of the liver disease. In a patient who is likely to die of heart disease, do you want to give him more bad cholesterol and less HDL? That is the biggest problem. I think modification of this molecule or maybe chopping off of one of the different limbs of the so-called octopus molecule may give you a better result. Because we, we just want this molecule to be acting on the fibrosis, not have the collateral effects. <laughs> Is Sanjeev that fine? Dr. Sanjeev? Sir. Dr. Uh, Hem Shankar is there. Dr. Hem Shankar. Professor Aurora, you have uh, nicely dealt with all the questions which has been put to you. And we are really definitely enlightened with the most upcoming non alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is having a long and uh, most prevalent disease these days. Patients are very anxious knowing about how can they reduce their uh, fats from the liver. If we ask them to exercise, cut down their calories, it becomes very, very difficult for them. They want some pill to have and to decrease the amount of fat present in the liver. 
it, it becomes very difficult to just influence and impress them that what is very necessary. But nicely said, you have told that uh, you have to just uh, cut down your income and uh, increase your expenditure rather than going on to some pill or the tablet for the treatment of the fatty liberty. Once again, thank you very much for your nice presentation of non cardiac fat liver disease. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Vajay Ji, can you say something? Yes, sir. Sir has given a very nice deliberation about the fatty liver. And so many confusions of our has been solved by his, his deliberation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, sir, for giving us precious time. Now should, we should go ahead with the second talk of the evening. The speaker is from Patna, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, who is a famous interventional gastroenterologist. <coughs> Chairpersons for the, <coughs> this session are our IMA president and senior surgeon, Dr. Chanwali Upadhyay, sir, Dr. Anjum Parvej, and Dr. B.K. Jaiswal. Dr. Sanjeev, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, respected seniors and dear colleagues. Uh, today's topic of discussion for me is management of acute pancreatitis. Uh, my slides may be boring. It does not contain cartoons. So I apologize for that right in the beginning. My talk is based on this uh, American College of Gastroenterology guideline published in 2013. Acute pancreatitis is acute inflammation of pancreas. It's not infection, it's inflammation. And this leads to multi-system involvement. This is a medical emergency associated with significant morbidity and mortality. So a prompt diagnosis and early aggressive management is required. The initial six to 12 hours of presentation of acute pancreatitis is supposed to be the golden hour. And we often see poorly managed patients in this golden hour leading to complications and deaths later on. And the most common worldwide etiologies are alcohol and gallstones. For the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis, there should be presence of at least two of the three criteria. Number one is pancreatic pain. Number two is serum amylase and or lipase more than three times upper limit of normal and characteristic finding from abdominal imaging. CT or MRI can be used if the diagnosis is unclear or if there is lack of clinical improvement within first 48 to 72 hours and if you suspect a complication associated with acute pancreatitis. Now what is pancreatic pain? In acute pancreatitis, there is a sudden onset, epigastric pain or left upper quadrant of abdomen. Pain is usually severe and constant and often radiates to the back. This is typical pancreatic pain. However, some patients may not have this typical presentation. And in that situation, you may need to use CT or MRI to establish a diagnosis. Now coming to serum amylase and lipase. Amylase has a limited sensitivity and a specificity and positive and negative predictive value. So it is not reliable alone. And it is usually preferred in combination with serum lipase. Because amylase rises quickly within few hours of pain and returns to normal within three to five days. So it may be normal at the onset of pain. And in alcoholics, where the pancreatic parenchyma is damaged, it may not rise. If the patient has high triglyceride level, it may not rise. And it may be falsely high in patients who do not have acute pancreatitis, has abdominal pain of some other cause, but they are having macroamylasemia, where amylase is combined with abnormal immunoglobulins, patients with decreased renal GFR, patients with inflammation of salivary glands, appendicitis, cholecystitis, intestinal obstruction and perforations, patient may have 
high levels of amylase. Lapis is supposed to be more specific because it is elevated for a long period of time. But again, the problem is macrolapisemia, patients with impaired renal function, appendicitis and cholecystitis can have raised levels of lipase even without acute pancreatitis. In diabetics, even in normal diabetics, they have a higher lipase levels than in non-diabetics for some unknown reasons. And the interesting thing is that there is no consensus on the appropriate cutoff of upper limit of normal of these two enzymes. Other enzymes have also been studied but has not been found to be better than these two enzymes. Coming to the abdominal imaging, transabdominal ultrasonography should be done in all patients with acute pancreatitis. It has a special value to detect gall stones and CBD stones if it can. CT scan is not routinely warranted and should be used if there is persistent pain, fever, nausea, vomiting, or we are not unable to resume oral feeding or to assess local complications. CT and MRI are comparable in detecting acute pancreatitis, but MRI has the advantage of <coughs> using MRCP to detect CBD stones and pancreatic ductal disruptions. If the patient has contrast allergy or has renal insufficiency, there MRI has the advantage that T2-weighted images without gadolinium contrast can detect pancreatic necrosis. Other tests like triglyceride, if you do not find a cause, you should do a triglyceride. And if this is more than 1000 milligram per deciliter, this is the cause of acute pancreatitis. In elderly people, more than 40 years, if there is no cause obvious, pancreatic tumor should be suspected. Endoscopic ultrasonography for elusive etiology in the setting of acute pancreatitis uh, has the limited role because doing endoscopic ultrasound in the presence of acutely inflamed pancreas may not be easy and visualization of CBD may be difficult here. If the patient is young and there is no obvious cause, genetic testing should be advised. Initial assessment and risk stratification is very important. Which patient will develop severe and which patient will have mild pancreatitis depends on the initial assessment and risk stratification. Hemodynamic status should be assessed immediately at presentation. Patient is a high or low risk depending on his morbidity and other clinical condition that will I show you later on. Should be assessed and if there is evidence of organ failure, patient should ideally be admitted in ICU or HDU. There are two distinct phases of acute pancreatitis. Early, that is within one week of onset of pain. This is characterized by systemic inflammatory response syndrome. May may not be associated with organ failure. And late week is after one week. That is characterized by local complications, pancreatic fluid, necro fluid collections, necrosis, cirrhosis, even isolated extra, extra pancreatic necrosis can be detected even if the patient's pancreas is not necrotized, but patient can have extra pancreatic necrosis. Pancreatitis can be severe or can be mild. And there has been a recent addition, a moderately severe pancreatitis, based on whether the patient has organ failure or not. If the patient has no organ failure or has a transient organ failure, depending on that, we classify. Most of the acute pancreatitis are mild and self-limiting and require, require only brief hospitalization. In mild acute pancreatitis, there is no evidence of organ failure or pancreatic necrosis and patients usually improve by 48 hours. In 15 to 20% of patients, they develop severe acute pancreatitis where we find that the patient has persistent organ failure or there is death. In moderately severe pancreatitis, the organ failure is transient or is associated with local or systemic complications in absence of persistent organ failure, like fluid collections, necrosis, patient has prolonged pain, leukocytosis, fever, patient has prolonged hospital stay, but less mortality. And if the organ failure is persistent in these cases, then patient develops severe acute pancreatitis. 
how do we assess organ failure the simplest way is patient having systolic blood pressure less than 90 pulmonary insufficiency indicated by pao2 of less than 60 mmhg renal failure creatinine level of more than 2 or a gi bleed of more than 500 ml blood loss per day so this organ failure can be transient means they resolve by or within 48 hours can be persistent if they do not resolve by 48 hours then uh, we can use this modified marshall score to assess organ failure but this is a bit complicated and i think this is the best thing to assess organ failure shock pulmonary insufficiency renal failure and gi bleeding then depending on atlanta revised classification 2013 the severity has been defined mild acute pancreatitis absence of organ failure and absence of local complications moderately severe acute pancreatitis local complications and or transient organ failure that resolve by 48 hours severe acute pancreatitis means persistent organ failure more than 48 hours so how do we predict which patient will develop severe disease there are so many scoring systems but they all are cumbersome and they require at least 48 hours to become accurate by that time patient's condition is obvious to suggest that patient is having severe acute pancreatitis and these scoring systems may delay appropriate action even the lab tests like hematocrit bun crp may be helpful but, but they can't predict severity ct and mri are not helpful in initial 48 to 72 hours so in the absence of reliable tests only clinical parameters are the best guide close clinical monitoring to assess early fluid losses hypovolemic shock and signs of organ dysfunction in association with intrinsic patient related risk factors like patient's age more than 55 years bmi more than 30 altered mental status comorbid disease sirs as indicated by pulse more than 90 respiration more than 20 temperature more than 38 degrees celsius or less than 36 degrees celsius wbc count of more than 12000 or less than 4000 burn more than 20 or rising burn hematocrit more than 44% or rising hematocrit elevated creatinine and radiological findings pleural effusions pulmonary infiltrates or multiple extensive extra pancreatic collection they indicate that this patient is going to have severe acute pancreatitis and should be managed in high dependency unit or in icu death in severe acute pancreatitis occurs due to development of persistence and progressive organ dysfunction and in the initial week systemic inflammatory response syndrome is responsible for organ failure if we have successful reversal of this sirs this prevents morbidity and mortality but if sirs persists as indicated by clinically by tachypnea and tachycardia this is going to be more detrimental and patient needs intensive care so how do we manage acute pancreatitis there is no effective medicine for the treatment of acute pancreatitis but studies have shown that early aggressive intravenous hydration is the only effective intervention why because hypovolemia coming out of either vomiting reduced oral intake or third spacing increased respiratory losses or diaphoresis along with pancreatic edema and microangiopathic effect decreases pancreatic blood flow this leads to death of pancreatic cells leading to necrosis further release of enzymes activation of numerous inflammatory cascades and worsening of severity of acute pancreatitis so hypovolemia is supposed to be the key factor for the development of severe acute pancreatitis so early aggressive intravenous resuscitation provides micro and macro circulatory support to prevent necrosis and activation of inflammatory cascades it has been suggested from various studies that 250 to 500 ml per hour of isotonic steroid solution should be given to all patients with acute pancreatitis but obviously caution should be taken in cardiac renal and elderly patients 
This aggressive hydration is most beneficial during the first 12 to 24 hours. And benefit beyond this time uh, is doubtful. Sometimes more rapid bolus repletion is required if there is severe volume depletion indicated by hypotension and tachycardia. Ringer's lactate solution is the preferred acetonic, acetonic crystallized replacement fluid. And fluid requirement is to be reassessed at frequent intervals within six hours of admission and then for next 24 to 48 hours. So how do you know you are giving adequate fluid? Hematocrate, burn, and creatinine may be surrogate markers for successful hydrogen. The goal is to decrease hematocrate and burn and maintain normal creatinine during the first day of hospitalization. However, there are some negative studies against the aggressive IV fluid therapy. But due to poor study design, hydration was not uh, proper within initial 6 to 12 hours and hydration was given over 48 hours. Patients were more sick in this study. So this study was criticized and still the in aggressive intravenous early hydration is considered gold standard. The rate of hydration is very important, not the overall volume. Ringer's lactate is a better, has a better electrolyte balance. A well-designed retrospective randomized trial showed Ringer's lactate to be more beneficial compared with normal saline with fewer patients developing SIRS. It has a more pH balance. As we all know, low pH may activate trypsinogen and can aggravate pancreatitis. Normal saline in large volumes may lead to non-anion gap hypo, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. So RL is ideal solution in this situation. In giving aggressive intravenous hydration, obviously caution should be taken in elderly patients, in cardiac and renal patients, and we should avoid volume overload, pulmonary edema, and abdominal compartment syndrome. CBP measurement is the most commonly used guide, but intrathoracic blood volume index is, has been found to be more accurate assessment of volume status. If there is no positive response within 6 to 12 hours of aggressive intravenous hydration, patient may not benefit from continued aggressive hydration. Now coming to the role of antibiotics. The routine use of prophylactic antibiotic in severe acute pancreatitis is not recommended. Antibiotics should be given only if you suspect some extra pancreatic infection like cholangitis, catheter acquired infection, urinary tract infection, or pneumonia. Use of antibiotic has not been recommended to prevent infection of sterile necrosis. Studies have shown has no benefit. But how do we distinguish between SIRS or infection? It's very difficult to distinguish because both may have fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, and leukocytosis. So you have to suspect whether the patient is infected or not. If you suspect infection, you may use antibiotic and send appropriate investigation for detect, to detect the source of infection. If cultures are negative and there is no definite source of infection, then you can continue discontinue antibiotics. Infected necrosis has higher mortality. So, infectious complications usually occur late in the course of disease. So, whether how to prevent infection? A meta-analysis involving 11 studies showed that the num uh, number to treat was 1,429 for one patient to benefit from prophylactic antibiotic. So, the current literature does not recommend prophylactic antibiotic. You have to use around 1,500 patients for, uh, with antibiotics for one patient to get benefited. So this is not recommended. Prevention of fungal infection also is not recommended because there is no definite um, study on that. One randomized controlled trial using selective decontamination of bowel targeting bacteria and fungi showed that there was decreased mortality, but further study is needed. Probiotics should not be used. This in one study showed patients to have increased mortality. If patients of necrotizing pancreatitis deteriorates after seven to 10 days of hospitalization, 
you may suspect that patient might have developed infected neck process. Now, how to establish a diagnosis? CT guided FNA is not routinely advised. It may be used in selected situations. To send other cultures, start empirical antibiotics while culture reports are awaited. And if culture reports are negative, you may discontinue antibiotics. Historically, prompt surgical debridement is the only treatment for infected necrosis, but this concept has not changed. Dr. Pramod Gurd's group showed that over a period of 10 years, 48 of 80 patients with infected necrosis, they successfully treated them with antibiotics alone without any intervention. Mortality was 23% in conservative group, whereas it was 54% in surgical groups. Another meta-analysis by the same group of eight studies showed that 409 patients with infected necrosis, out of them, 324 were treated successfully with antibiotics alone without any intervention. So if you suspect infected necrosis, you put patient on antibiotics, you do a close supervision, and if required, in addition, minimal intervention, like percutaneous drainage or endoscopic drainage or laparoscopic drainage should be done. Antibiotics, there are very less number of antibiotics known to penetrate pancreatic necrosis. So you don't have a large group of antibiotics. You have to use only this within this group. So use of antibiotics should be done with caution. Now coming to nutrition. In my liquid pancreatitis, Oral feeding should be started immediately once the pain and vomiting resolves. And initiation with a clear liquid diet is not necessarily required. One can start with a low-fat solid diet that gives more calories. In severe acute pancreatitis, internal nutrition is recommended. Parenteral nutrition should only be used if internal root is not available or is not tolerated or is not meeting caloric requirements. Nasogastric and nasoregional delivery of internal feeding is comparable. But coming to the role of ERCP, there are only two conditions. One is cholangitis, another is ongoing biliary obstruction. If there is evidence of cholangitis, then early ERCP is recommended ideally within 24 hours of hospital admission. If the patient has ongoing biliary obstruction as evidenced by lab and clinical parameters, then a planned ERCP needs to be done. ERCP is not recommended to diagnose CBD stone. Endoscopic ultrasound and MRCP are better options for this. Then coming to role of surgery. In mild biliary pancreatitis, polycystectomy should be done before patient is discharged. In severe acute pancreatitis, one has to wait for four to six weeks till there is complete recovery of the inflammation. In asymptomatic cirrhosis, collections, or necrosis, there is no intervention is required. In stable patients with infected necrosis or symptomatic cirrhosis, if possible, intervention should be delayed by four weeks, if possible, so that a mature wall can develop around the cyst or necrotic material for the intervention to be more successful and with less complications. And even if intervention is required, minimally invasive technique, either percutaneous or endoscopic or a laparoscopic should be used to manage infected necrosis. Thank you. From my side, this is all from my side. I tried to make it simple based on um, the, um, the American College of Gastroenterology guideline. I did not um, quote uh, studies but this is based on this guideline simply. Thank, thank you, Sanjeev. Chairman, sir. You have given a nice deliberation about the management symptoms of the acute pancreatitis. In our surgical practice, the acute pancreatitis is the worst condition of acute abdomen. Yes, sir. Here, as you know, just you have told us he went to operate and went not to operate. And the commonest cause which we get in our practical practice is that the gallstones or more 
the gallstones are causing the pancreatitis and as you have told the serum mileage is raised like page is raised we go for ultrasound and we see that there is a stone in the gall bladder of there is a stone in the cvd also we go for further investigations and just you have told that the ct scan is also not helpful up to the 48 to 72 hours the patient is suffering from acute appendicitis pancreatitis and if we go for ct we are not getting any findings uac can tell something that the pancreas is swollen there is peri pancreatic collections the whole bladder is inflamed there is peri cholecystic collection there is a stone in the cvd and there is a stone in the gall bladder with this thing the most important thing the biliary sludge very cell biliary sludge is more important for causing the pancreatitis than the large stone which is in the gall bladder or in the cvd so we must keep in mind that when the biliary sludge may lead to acute pancreatitis and pancreatitis just you have liberated it will be mild it moderate severe so when to operate and when not to operate if we are going to operate immediately in this condition this will not give us a good result so this is the condition of acute abdomen when you should keep restraint over operating the patients we must wait and watch for further progress and you have just elaborated very nicely how to manage by medical management like the most important thing is hypovolemia and the causes of hypovolemia you have elaborated very nicely and management of the hypovolemia also patients <coughs> like sirs systemic inflammatory response syndrome and if it is not there at this stage then the patient goes into the further condition of shock and that may lead to death of the patient so the management of the complications like development of the pseudo cyst that is pseudo pancreatic cyst or pseudo pseudo pancreatic cyst like the collections which are not communicating with the tributary of the pancreatic duct are known as pseudo pseudo pancreatic cyst and the pseudo pancreatic cyst is the cyst which is communicating with any of the tributary of the pancreatic duct and this remains for a longer period and you have tell told that we have to wait and watch for four weeks at four cm but we say that six weeks and size of six cm and it if it is not resolving then go for operations which you have enumerated now we take by the laparoscopic histogastrostomy if it is in the tail region blue and white gastrogastrostomy otherwise we should wait and watch in the most of the cases we see that this disappears this yes. pseudo cyst disappears by the medical management and if there is any pseudo pseudo pancreatic cyst with the collection of the pancreatic enzymes or fluid which is not communicating it may be absorbed or it may really need aspiration and it will be cured now how to manage the acute pancreatitis when it is either mild severe or when it has become complicated by necrosis we have told very nicely about the role of the antibiotics and second important thing which you have uttered which is to know that the patient should be given food by mouth or enteral nutrition even a severe condition of the acute pancreatitis the patient may be given enteral nutrition which is far better because just you have told that it clears the bacteria and helps in cure of the patient very fastly and over that i have to say that the operation is needed when there is necrosis and it doesn't resolve with the antibiotic then necrosectomy is a must either by laparoscopic method by open method if there is an abscess formation just you have told by different methods you have to tend it so you have related every point very nicely thank you sir for this very nice deliberation over the management and feature of acute pancreatitis thank you sanjeev sanjeev good yes. evening yes yeah, excellent <laughs> talk don't uh, don't, don't throw don't throw a hard question nice 
<laughs> See, yeah, two tendencies. One is ordering a mileage and lipase together. It's a common pen habit, right? So, yes. how much incremental benefit do we gain by adding these two investigations together? And second is there is a tendency of monitoring serial amylase values during the course of patient's admission. So how does that help or does that only increase the cost? Amylase and lapis do not require to be monitored serially. This is one-time test. These have diagnostic value and should be done together because if I, either of this is raised with a pancreatic pain, the diagnosis is confirmed. So maybe amylase is normal and lipase is raised more than three times upper limit of normal and patient has pancreatic pain, then, then your diagnosis is confirmed. Amylase is not a very reliable test because it rises early and disappears early. So combination of amylase with lipase gives more diagnostic value rather than doing one of them alone and should not be monitored serially because it automatically decreases. It does not mean that the inflammation is subsiding. Inflammation might be rising and Navalis lapis level might be decreasing. So there is no need to do it serially. One more is a case of gallstone-induced severe pancreatitis, right? Yes. A patient has evolving pseudocyst gallstones are there and we know that if we leave it for more than one month, 30% of them might have another episode of pancreatitis, right? So yes. how much if, if we leave them for more than that, with what <laughs> safety advice and or what, what risk do we explain to them? Uh, you said gallstone and uh, CBD stone also? No, no, no. Gallstone uh, induced uh, pancreatitis, leaving gallstones because yeah. of internal inflammation settling. So what is the risk? Mm -hmm. Risk of developing another episode of pancreatitis yes. is uh, is usual. Is usual. So we should monitor the patient closely, and once you are very sure that the patient is now operable, should be operated. If the inflammation is severe, you have no other choice but to wait and watch. The patient may have another attack of pancreatitis. You can't prevent that. In that case, can you put in a stent in CBD for the waiting period if that appears to be too long? See, the indication in acute pancreatitis for ERCP is only two. If the patient has cholangitis or has ongoing biliary obstruction, there is no other recommended indication for ERCP in acute pancreatitis. So it should not be recommended. Something here, just I want to ask. In some patients we have seen, patient has symptomatically improved, but lipase level is still higher two, three or four times more than the normal. What's the reason? Because patient has no symptoms at all. Okay, patient might be a diabetic. Patient might have a reduced GFR. Yeah. Patient may have macrolipidemia. Or patient might be developing some local complications like cirrhosis or, or, or necrosis. In that situation, the enzyme may remain elevated. For a long period of time. Just as Dr. Harper <coughs> has told, uh, if the patient uh, has a delayed recovery, in that case, the patient has jaundice or uh, obstruction, you have put the stand there. The chances of septicemia will be there or not? See, any ERCP procedure is associated with the risk of meningitis and septicemia. So, um, by putting contrast inside the bile, that you are increasing the risk of uh, cholangitis and sepsis. So that risk will remain there. But at the same time, the patient has cholangitis and you are providing biliary decompression, you are uh, improving the bile flow, then the chances of uh, cholangitis settling down is more than uh, clearing up of cholangitis. Obviously, you need to give antibiotic together with the ERCP procedure. One question from the audience, it is Prashant. Uh, so is, is there any chance of destruction of beta cells, alpha cells or phylates of pancreas? And if so, are there any early markers of that so that we can monitor sugars and prevent uh, an impending doom? 
Hmm. Usually, uh, if the pancreatic necrosis is extensive, involving uh, the head, body, and tail everywhere, then the chances of beta cell destruction may be there. But no one is sure. There is no study, I think, to uh, correlate between the extent of necrosis and loss of beta cells. That will depend how it goes, how the recovery of the cells goes. There is no marker, I think, for that. And which medicine do you consider the best for pancreatic pain in acute pancreatitis? Pancreatic pain. Yeah. yeah, in the current situation when the narcotics are not available, we have only one choice, that is tramadol. Because uh, um, NSAIDs can be used, but uh, the chances of in hypovolemic patient, chances of developing renal insufficiency is, sufficiency is more. So tramadol is safer in this scenario. Dr. Sanjeev. Boss. What is world of pancreatic necrosis? Is it a radiological term or any clinical implication? Many times uh, we read. Sir, pancreatitis is of two types. Interstitial pancreatitis, where there is only pancreatic edema, and another is necrotizing pancreatitis, pancreatitis, when there is necrosis of the pancreatic parenchyma as well. When there is necrotizing pancreatitis, during first four weeks, the collection of necrotizing pancreatitis is called acute necrotic collection. By the four weeks time, there is a wall developed around this necrotic collection and then this is called wall of necrosis. So wall of necrosis is a sequelae of acute necrotizing necrotic. pancreatitis after four weeks. Pseudocyst is a sequelae of acute interstitial pancreatitis after four weeks. Which has got no necrotic material. No, right. it's interstitial pancreatitis. Simple pancreatic fluid collections <coughs> that is called out. Rajiv, necrosis is diagnosed with the help of CT scan. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. CT scan will give you the clear cut picture of necrosis. Yes, non enhancing. Uh, this is the radiological term, sir. Yes. I think. It will, it, it, dead areas will not enhance. Once you give intravenous contrast, the dead necrotic areas will not enhance and will leave hypodense spots in the pancreas. That is how necrosis is picked up at CT scans. MRI can also pick up necrosis. Ultrasonography has a limitation. It may or may not pick up necros necrotic areas. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you, Sanjeev, for simplified talk Thank you. <coughs> of a complex subject. Now, <coughs> we should move to the next topic. This is the last topic of the evening. <clears throat> which uh, our speaker is Sanjeev Thakur from Patna, a famous gastroenterologist. Chairperson for this session is Dr. Hemsankar Sharma and myself. In his absence, may I request Dr. Sanjeev Kumar to chair the session along with me. Dr. Sanjeev, please. Are my slides visible? Yes, yes, it is visible. Sanjeev, shall I begin? Yeah, clear. Yes, 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 you go ahead. Okay, so I'm well aware that this is the last talk of a Sunday evening. So though the topic is an overview, I'll be brief discussing a few core concepts of acute liver failure. And the basis of this talk is the past ESL guidelines and the recent INSL guidelines, which were issued this, issued this year in June. And Dr. Anil Arora was one of the, uh, the pioneers who framed this. Now, starting with the fact, the mortality of acute liver failure has reduced from 80 to about 56%. And this reduction is parallel to what we have achieved in post-transplant survival. And this is achieved with better supportive care, improved transplant techniques, and better post-transplant immunosuppression. 
Now to reduce it further from here, the onus is on us. If we do better primary care management, if we refer patient in time when they are still salvageable, this will further go down. Now starting with the definition, if a person who has a pre-existing healthy liver develops jaundice, and this is complicated with coagulopathy within a few weeks, and this a few weeks is taken mostly as four weeks, then this is called acute liver injury. And when encephalopathy is added to coagulopathy, then this is called acute liver failure. Now, Western societies, they further split it into hyperacute, acute, and subacute. But our Indian societies tell us that our population with acute liver failure is quite homogeneous. And most of our cases are hyperacute. So we need not use this uh, further differentiation. Now, this is a useful slide which tells us what happens inside the liver once we get the injury. So at the baseline, we have 100% liver function and the insult happens in the form of infection or a toxic injury. Now, simultaneous with the insult, there is inflammatory response to contain that insult and to get rid of the necrotic tissue and liver regeneration starts. Now, depending on the impact and its perpetuation of uh, insult, further reduction in liver uh, reserve occurs. And this reserve as the reserve declines, patient presents to us with jaundice further down as coagulopathy, further down as encephalopathy, till it reaches a critical liver volume where nothing else than a liver transplant can salvage the patient. Now, till this moment, if we intervene, we provide good supportive care for a sufficient duration, liver can fully regenerate. And beyond this margin, multi-organ multi failure develops and the patient dies. So the point is that this happens very fast, not as it is demonstrated here. And if we do not anticipate the encephalopathy coming, if we are not vigilant at the stage of jaundice, we usually miss this critical period and the patient lands to the eventuality of death. The etiology in our part is mostly viral, that is followed by drugs, and among drugs, the most common is AKT. Now, this is the typical case that we get in our day-to-day -day practice. It's a young female who presented to primary clinic with prodromal jaundice, had conjugated hyperbilirubinemia and raised liver enzymes. She was given UDC B complex and called for a follow-up. She presented early, three days later with deeper jaundice. She was tired and was vomiting. And then she was admitted. She was given fluids and antiemetics. The sensorium worsened further and she became unconscious in 48 hours. Serum ammonia was done. It was high. And this is, this is to reiterate the fact that our setups are very primed with ammonia. The studies that we have are mostly with arterial ammonias and the values that are taken are in fasting, which is rarely used in our practices, but we get frequent ammonia reports even before a PT report comes. So remember, coagulopathy comes first and encephalopathy later, so PT should be always uh, the first investigation ordered. So when you reach the scene, you have unconscious patient on supplemental oxygen, and we have everything on IV, meropenam, PPIs, Lola, Rifaximin, Lactylose, Manitol, Albumin, FFPs. Attendants are agitated because they walked in with a walking patient, and now the patient is unconscious. And you are there confused and worried that where I should insinuate. Attendants hanging over your shoulders to see the magic wand. Now, what we can do here is we can do a careful review of the history and the investigation charts. And we should try to find out something complicated or new existing or something mimicking of a liver failure. And in our setup, it's very important to rule out tropical infections like malaria, typhoid, lepto, leptospirosis, or Prolonged fever is persisted with jaundice, skin rashes, subcutaneous or mucosal bleeds, 
and labs support these diagnosis when they saw mild rise of liver enzymes normal or near normal pt and bilirubin where indirect hyperbilirubin may predominate on examination if you have gross ascites or splenomegaly again this pulls us away from acute liver failure to other causes which have significant implications on treatment strategy now what potential outcomes that we can suggest to this patient so either she should be put on liver assist these devices that is to be followed by olt or to face the eventuality now the question is where did we miss in this case and the answer is in the beginning so when we have a case of jaundice at the first meeting exclude cirrhosis other significant liver injuries and other significant comorbidities which may preclude a transplant if the need arises second is make full effort to determine etiology and monitor pt closely because we know that after jaundice the first decomposition to happen is coagulopathy now screen intensively for hepatic encephalopathy because early stages can be observed by very subtle changes and if this comes then it's a warning bell so at the stage of coagulopathy we should initiate discussion with a tertiary care center and we should also prime the patient for a probable need of liver transplant if it arises initiate the discussion even if it is not immediately relevant and another important thing is that even if the patient is not suitable for transplant we should consider a transfer to a tertiary care hospital because they have better support systems even for the patients who are not transplanted so the bottom line is shift at the first sign of hepatic encephalopathy and the essentials of shifting are arrange bed at accepting unit before starting to send the patient ensure a safe transit secure two iv lines correct volume status acidosis and hypoglycemia intubate if possible if the coma is deeper or worsening or if we have chest complications and there should be no active bleeding anywhere when we are shifting the patient now once we have shifted those who are for transplant we have two further group of patient left with us one who is too sick for transplant that is those who have dilated pupils who are decorticate or decerebrating or those who have invasive infections or those whose inotropic requirements are escalating we know the prognosis we need to explain the relatives and continue with whatever support we can give the salvageable vegetable group where we have opted for a medical management they should be monitored very closely for appearance of candidacy for liver transplant and for this we have various models available in the form of clinical prognosis indicators which is developed by pgi group meld kings college or clichy criteria and the recently flavored ones are alcoholic liver failure dynamic evolving scores which are scored over 3 days or a change in meld these look complicated but the parameters are simple that we test day to day we only need a habit to use them now what are the general supports while we are managing the patients with us we should complete the investigation in the form of getting a complete liver profile ultrasound abdomen getting arterial ammonia and then we should have a basic liver, renal functions arterial blood gases tell us about the cardiopulmonary status and lactate levels are a useful uh, marker of his perfusion status now check for hepatitis a b and e in all cases we should have a low threshold for checking for herpes simplex other viruses should be checked if the patient is immunocompromised all eligible females should be checked for pregnancy and autoimmune markers if we don't find any don't find any of these one third of these cases are complicated by pancreatitis so remember to check lipase or amylase now further down the treatment lane we should have basic baseline culture from respiratory blood and urine passages and these cultures cultures should be repeated every 48 hours even if there are no frank signs of infection 
chest and heart status should be monitored vitals should be monitored early urine output charting should be done and neurological status should be closely monitored volume should be expanded using normal saline not using rl as it was in previous study regions that lactate is our important marker for perfusion stress ulcer prophylaxis should be given using sucralfate and hypoglycemia is a important concern and we use here 10 and or 20% dextrose not 5% because it may increase cerebral edema which is a important uh, uh, adverse prognostic event in these conditions restrict use of clotting factors don't start using ffp is the moment you see rising pt regions that in acute liver failure there is a balanced disturbance of both pro and anticoagulant factors so bleeding is rarely a dangerous event in these patients so clotting factors are used only if we have clinical bleeding or we are planning any invasive in, uh, intervention prophylactic and antibiotics are used if the patient is hypotensive has sars or is listed for transplant now anti ammonia measures they are on in all the cases but remember that rifaximin and lactulose are not validated in acute liver failure so we need more uh, documentary proof we need more data lola is uh, recently refuted in a large study and we should not it is contraindicated when the creatinine is above 3.5 N-acetyl cysteine has value in early cases, even if the patient is not a paracetamol-based uh, poisoning. Avoid sedatives because it hampers the neurological assessment, and avoid hep hepatotoxic and nephrotoxic drugs. Now we have got specific measures for few etiologies, like nucleotide or nucleoside analogs for B, and rivavirin is tried in some trials for hepatitis E. a few drug poisonings have their specific antidotes hypersensitivity if we get in liver biopsy steroids can be tried and all pregnant ladies should be delivered but the bottom line is that for these interventions to have a positive impact that time may be too late for the patient so while these are on if we sense uh, impending he or he coming transfer now the summary of standard care is avoid colloids 5% dextrose and rl no prophylactic mannitol or anti convulsant if seizures occur give midazolam as short acting benzodiazepine no ffp for prolonged pt or uh, don't treat every thrombocytopenia if you are not planning intervention if sepsis or sars or culture awaited or culture not positive IV ceftriaxone is the antibiotic recommended by Inasal. Shift immediately if equip ICU is not available, or and preferably to a setup with transplant backup at the first sign of neurological decompensation. Now a few lines about support awaiting transplant and awaiting transplant. We have. Artificial liver device and bio-artificial liver device, which aim to remove both. Uh, this water soluble and hydrophobic toxins from the blood in artificial liver assist devices we have column chromatography and adjuvant regions examples of which are mars spad or fpsa in bio artificial uh, liver supports we have column chromatography with added hepatocytes which are either from porcine source or hepatomas cell lines now this slide was added just to emphasize that plasma pheresis which we can do at our place is coming in a good way and the studies are optimistic even in patients who are not going for transplant this year in january we had a meta analysis where they had said that there is definite mortality benefit in aclf and there was a tendency to benefit in acute liver failure also but till the time comes the present status is that these are bridge to transplant now liver transplant is the most significant development that occurs that has occurred in past 40 years in this field and if we select our uh, cases properly and if we trans uh, plan the surgery properly we have a one year survival approaching 80% now on this side we have a kaplan meier curve which shows uh, increasing survival 
every five years. But the major problem is its limited availability, limited organ supply, and getting suitable patient who has a donor and who has sufficient money. Now the future has future lies with hepatocyte transplant, mesenchymal stem cell transplant, or organoids or liver scaffolds, which we can grow in labs. Then we'll not have any organs, uh, organ sorties, or any specific setup issues or less issues with transpose transplant immunosuppression. So remember this, that this is a tale of two weeks. It's a T20 in cases of jaundice, where either you can be crowned or you can get a knockout punch. Anticipation holds the key. So anticipate a decompensation and get the crown. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Sanjeev, for stating the hard facts. We know this is the dreaded condition with high mortality. Good news, <clears throat> you said that mortality has decreased <clears throat> with proper management. I request Sanjeev Kumar to <coughs> share his experience while managing acute liver failure. Where is Sanjeev? Uh, <laughs> yes, boss. Very, very bad disease. Very bad disease for Bihar. You know, there is no liver transplant center in Bihar. But we get cases of acute liver failure. So we we have to rely only on conservative treatment. If the patient's luck is good, he may recover. If the patient's luck is not good, he cannot reach up to a transplant center, and he does. If he does not improve with conservative management, there is no hope for him or her. So this is very 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 sorrow uh, state of affairs as far as this dreaded disease is concerned. We are totally disappointed when a patient with acute liver failure comes to us because we don't have a dedicated center for this. Dr. Thakur. Yes, see, Sajeev, my point is that when a patient of acute liver failure comes better, understand it, prognosticate it, my, my point is anticipate the doom, right? Yes. Prepare the patients early, prepare them from a sudden shock, and prepare your hospital furniture and lot of glassware. Right? Because they are walking in with a healthy one and they are going with someone on the stool. Right? Yes, friends, our original chairperson, Dr. Hemsankar Sarma, has rejoined us. <laughs> I'm sorry, Please. Sanjeev, I had to deliver a talk in RSDI also. Parallel. Oh. So I was just cut off for 20 minutes. So I'm sorry, but I, I, I was just listening to you as well from this side. Uh, I agree with Sanjay Kumar that he said that whenever in Bihar we are treating acute liver, liver failure, we are cutting a sorry figure. But I think gone are those days. Any a decade ago, we were certainly cutting sorry figures. But uh, with the advent of the development, particularly in Patna, under the stewardship leadership of Dr. Agarwal, who has been the mesmerizing captain of this state and all dynamic persons like you and Sanjeev, both Sanjeevs, right? And the whole team of affairs over there, which is currently managing in Patna uh, with many private hospitals and all that, and even in the IGIMS. Now we are almost rest assured that we will be saving at least 80% of them. And I think you will agree with me that you all have been very helping hand to all of, all of us over Bihar that uh, whenever we are in trouble, we just refer it to you all, and you are all managing it in the best possible way. And we are getting back our patients, almost 80% of them. But certainly uh, the era in the most developed countries and all that where you talk about the acute poisonings and acute hepatic failure, basically of mushroom poisonings and all that, which are whether the majority of the cases are being liver transplanted. And uh, here also uh, in uh, hepatitis and all that, there are, there are problems, it has, we have got limitations, but in acute liver failure, definitely yes. Uh, there are, we are cutting some sorry figures, but I think in the coming era or few years of time, we will be improving more and more. And that is the guidance of our godfathers like Dr. Agrawal, 
and all of you the captains now sanjeev thakur sanjeev kumar and the whole team of affairs we will be doing uh, our our job at least as a general physician over here and a promising gastroenterologist we are also having in our town as well so over to dr rajiv sinha <coughs> thank you sir for nice comments thank you like <coughs> speak comment from dr bk arawal sir about uh, on this talk sir uh, yes sir it is still with us yeah yes sir agrawal sir can you unmute yourself right yeah. see the sir. all the three talks were excellent i think uh, they have given a full picture of pathogenesis as well as the management and now the with the increase of cases of uh, uh, fatty liver and nfld i think we are we will be getting more and more patients of cirrhosis and portal hypertension and the complications related to that so i think it is a good um, attempt to start this uh, activity especially is all gastroenterology i think uh, most of our uh, practice of general physician medicine and general practitioners are related to gastroenterology and liver disease but we have got large number of patients who are coming with the fatty liver ultrasound report and they are asymptomatic and there some enzymes elevated and it is very difficult to manage these fellows but one thing is very clear the exercise A reduction of calories, I think, is going to give a long way. So, Dr. Hemshankar Sharma, it's a very nice program organized. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. <clears throat> Now we should close the session with thanking you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Harpi, are you here? You are well, sir. Yes, yes. Yes, Sanjeev. Thank, thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you, sir. Night, thank you. excellent Thanks. program organized well thank you thank you thank you, thank you to everybody thank, thank you. you sir thank you padya sir for joining thank you thank you everybody thank you sir thank you sir thank you everybody now we should leave thank you very much thank you the organizer and this thank you the, and, uh, and all the support I, I, to sun pharma and i guess sun pharma i think to be uh, thanked seriously yes, for yes, giving yes, their, yes. their support to this for this program thank you thank you very much thank you sun pharma oh. thank you sir oh. thank you very much. now we should leave